Okay. Before I introduce our last speaker, um, Dr. Michael Siegel, I'll just mention to you that, in case you didn't notice, I lost the battle with a kitchen cabinet last night and whacked myself with it. The very first person I called was actually a pediatric plastic surgeon uh, from Children's asking her for a referral to an adult plastic surgeon. So I reached back to you know, my roots there. Okay, Michael Siegel. I've actually known Michael for a very, very long time since he was practicing at CHLA. He's board certified in pediatrics and also um, pediatric hematology oncology, which is one of the largest departments and divisions at CHLA. He has gone on and he has been a medical director, he's been a CMO, he's been a director of medical affairs, but for the last 10 years, he's been at Molina Healthcare. And we were really, interested and excited to have Michael join us because Melina has been a leader in Medi-Cal managed care um, for the pediatric population. Started out in only one state, but has merged and is now in 12 states, I think. I think it is, 12 states. And as medical director and really spending a lot of time in quality of care, Michael is across the adult pediatric spectrum, but has some, I, and I hope you're gonna share with us the stories in, about the building of a national NICU program uh, related to care of children. Um, well, they're not children yet, they're still babies, uh, who have to be in an NICU, in a neonatology intensive care unit. Um, and these are very, very sick, sick babies. So Michael, please. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and the committee who put together the program tonight. And Paul, wherever you are, yep, there he is. <laughs> thank you. It's great to see you again. Um, I guess there we go. Okay. Well, I, I came here to talk about quality improvement in Medicaid and focused on managed care organizations, but. Um, having heard and talked to a bunch of people uh, since I got here, I want to uh, uh, also focus on some of the programs that we feel uh, benefit um, our members. And now I'm going to just focus on our little members, the pedi uh, pediatric population. So I think we've been through the numbers about why Medicaid is so important to children. Over half the deliveries in this country are uh, insured through Medicaid. One in three children, I think, as Anne mentioned, are now insured through Medicaid across the country. Uh, managed care organizations uh, have spread now to 39 states in terms of states contracting with them. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that. I think, I'd like to think that it's because people recognize that a coordinated care model brings a lot of value to um, pediatric patients as well as adults, but I also know that there's some uh, very strong financial pressures that have led to this as well. Um, as Ann pointed out, the state of California is a miser when it comes to funding, uh, not only for hospitals and doctors, but also for managed care plans. Uh, we are not a rate setter, we are a rate taker. Um, so we're not here uh, raising premiums to the state so they'll pay us every year more. Uh, we know there's tremendous uh, quality gaps in pediatric care and more so in Medicaid. Uh, so we believe as a company that's totally focused on disadvantaged populations and uh, having so many children by virtue of working in Medicaid, that it's important for us to focus on uh, pediatric care. Um, Paul had a little commercial. I'm going to have a little one here, too. Uh, Molina Healthcare uh, has more NCQA accredited plans across the country than any other plan uh, in the Medicaid space. Uh, when I started at uh, Molina 10 years ago, uh, about two thirds of the managed Medicaid plans uh, went for NCQA accreditation, and uh, as opposed to, at that point, about 90% of the commercial plans. But from the very beginning of our organization, it has been an expectation, not an exception, 
that every one of our plans will go through. And currently from this map, of our 12 health plans, which includes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, nine are NCQA accredited. The other three aren't because they're too new and you have to be in operation for a number of years before you can go through the accreditation process. Now, NCQA has created some metrics by which we can uh, assess how well we're doing in terms of our population and their healthcare needs. Uh, one of the metrics is HEDIS, um, and these are just an example of the children's HEDIS uh, measures that are used. The other program that they have uh, started, done is called the CAP survey. Uh, this is synonymous with a member satisfaction, customer satisfaction survey. And it's one that's sent out to members to assess uh, their feelings about the quality of care they're getting through their health plan, from their physicians, and from their specialists. Now, children in Medicaid are different for a lot of reasons, and this translates also into health conditions. And as you can see, um, in terms of certain entities like asthma, ADHD, and serious emotional and behavioral difficulties, those children in Medicaid are far different than uh, the individuals, the children in un insured through private carriers. There are a lot of reasons for this, but as we've discovered over the years is, you know, healthcare and your access to healthcare is important, but that's only one aspect that determines your overall healthcare status. And I know that as opposed when I started practicing, thinking, well, if these people would just keep their appointments, then they would just, you know, be, good, be healthy. But that's not the case. In fact, we now know that the biggest determinant of our health is our socioeconomic status and the health determinants that go around what that status brings. So in our population who suffer from housing security issues, do you know that in, in LA County, the vacancy rate for apartments is now 2%? And that 80% of the new units, and if you drive around LA, you can see them, that are being built are aimed toward high income individuals. So where does that leave people who you know, are making minimum wage or less in terms of finding a place to live? Uh, food security is a major issue, um, we know where the food deserts are, but where there are lots of uh, fast food residents exist, uh, in, uh, outlets existing, personal safety, legal issues, family configuration, psychological disease burden, which is higher in a lower socioeconomic population, as well as health literacy. I read this the other day and it just boggled my mind. 14% of the US population can't read. 19% of high school graduates can't read. 50% of the adult population can't read beyond a sixth grade level. Uh, language and culture also plays an important part and this also creates some challenges for us in working with our members in terms of their healthcare needs. I am going to skip down to the focus that states are now placing on quality in terms of working with them uh, in their states. If you want to be licensed in certain states now, you have to have NCQ accreditation. If you want to compete for state contracts, you in many states now need NCQA accreditation. And in terms of competing within a state against other payers for contracts, one of the areas that has been highlighted more and more are your quality outcome results. So HEDIS, as we briefly looked at earlier, the health metrics play an important role now for us when we go out to bid um, on a 
uh, book of business with a state. Auto assignment of members. If members haven't chosen a health plan, one of the ways that states determine where they go is by the quality metrics that the plans are producing. There are financial rewards and penalties, and when your margins are as thin as ours are, um, those penalties of one or two percent can literally uh, turn a, a good year in terms of a financial outcome into a bad one. Uh, they can also impose membership freezes, and at, uh, if they want to, they can also take away your contract based on your quality performance. In terms of the programs that Lisa uh, alluded to, um, approximately four years ago, I recognized that there were uh, gaps in our coverage of care in terms of uh, not the financing, but the resources to help those individuals uh, coordinate their care. So I started two programs. One was a national high-risk OB program, and the other was a NICU program. Uh, both involved assigning uh, case managers to uh, women who were high-risk for their OB care, and in our population with our prematurity rate, uh, this is 10% or above the, uh, in terms of the number of women who are high-risk. Um, we currently have, uh, across the country, about 700 women in that program. Each of them have an individual case manager who work with them, and if necessary, um, have a community health worker in the state that they're located who can go out and work with them directly um, to make sure they're making their appointments, uh, they're seeing the appropriate doctor in terms of it's high risk, are you seeing a high risk OB physician, um, and also to work with them on their social needs in terms of housing, food, and other needs that they may have. In terms of the NICU program, we now uh, follow 400 infants in the NICU on any given day. And uh, with that program, uh, we have a case manager assigned to each of those infants. And not only do they follow them uh, in the NICU, but uh, for the 30 days afterwards before we turn them back over to the state programs to follow themselves, the state plans. Um, this is an example of a child who had many needs that went beyond his immediate health care. It's a 10-year-old who was diagnosed with a brain tumor, uh, not in California who had recently moved to the US. Uh, there was a family of five, two, two parents and three children. The father was the only one who spoke English. Um, he was having multiple ER visits and admissions to the hospital. And the barriers that we saw were uh, not the healthcare, because the healthcare was excellent, but the education of the parents, the language, and transportation barriers that they faced. Um, so upon enrollment, we assigned a, a case manager and a community health worker to the family. Uh, we organized their transportation to all of their doctor visits. This is a benefit under Medicaid. Uh, the community health worker went with them with an interpreter to their visits. Um, and uh, also went with them to the state offices to basically sign them up for services which they were eligible for, which they were not aware of, um, so that they would have more support at home. Uh, during the past year, the child after that had only uh, one ER visit and was never readmitted to the hospital. So I think, you know, this is an example of how not only the fantastic medical care that can be provided, but paying attention to the social determinants and the needs once someone's outside of the hospital can play a significant role. This is from the program that I started. Uh, we had a 25-year-old uh, pregnant 
woman who was in her first trimester. She had a history of substance abuse. She was HIV positive. Um, she had three children, all of whom were under the custody of the maternal grandmother, and she was currently on methadone and taking AZT, which is a drug that is taken prophylactically by the mother to prevent transmission of HIV to the infant. Uh, the support services that were organized around her included uh, an NI, uh, I, excuse me, OB case manager, who worked with her to make sure she was making her appointments. She was also checking her pharmacy records to make sure she was uh, filling all of her drugs and especially the ACT, AZT on a regular basis. There was a community health worker assigned to her to work, to work with her in terms of getting her OB appointments, meeting her there. And on our social service team, we had social workers working with her to provide support for her pre and post uh, delivery needs. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm at my 10 minutes and uh, be more than happy to address any questions during our question and answer period. Thank you.